I this just conference will now be recorded. Second. There we go. Great. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for the RTD Accountability Committee Operations Subcommittee. Um, we have a fairly packed agenda, so it is one, and we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, in terms of agenda, just as a reminder, um, if folks have questions, comments, uh, members of the committee, any additional feedback in terms of the meeting. Um, minutes for the January 20th summary, so you can provide that to Dr. Cog's staff. There are a few items in there that I'd like to get just clarified, Matthew, so anticipate those from me. Um, we will move into the discussion items. Uh, we're going to start with a presentation um, by our committee member, Kristen Trustman, um, who's going to talk a little bit about equity and procurement. This is building off of our previous conversation from um, January 20th, where we heard from CCDC, uh, Colorado Press Disability Coalition. Um, we'll then move to uh, what I'm hoping will be a robust discussion uh, around the state audit recommendations on operator retention and fare box recovery ratio. Um, and then we will wrap up with some administrative items. So with that, any questions, comments um, from members of the committee before we get started? All right, Kristen, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dea. Uh, I really focused on fixed route procurement. I didn't, I knew we were gonna talk about paratransit at a later meeting. So, um, I wanted to start out with the EPA regulation for the minimum clear floor space on buses. And that is 30 inches by 48 inches. Now that is also the exact size of standard wheelchair. So me in my manual chair, I am 28 by 28 inches, well, pretty much 30 inches by 48 inches. Some of the larger power chairs are 27 inches by 44 inches, so it's kind of tough to fit into that 30 by 48 inch space. So please keep that in mind as I go through my slides that the standard minimum clear floor space is 30 by 48, but so is the size of a standard wheelchair. And Kristen, before you move over to your slides, I'm just gonna ask that if folks are not speaking, if you all could just be sure to put yourselves on mute so that we can um, clearly hear your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So this is one of my favorite pictures of what was happening on some of the older Gillig buses. And Gillig is the brand name of the buses that RTD has on the road right now. It used to be that the wheelchair securement areas were across the aisle from each other. So when both areas were occupied, the aisle width was decreased to approximately four inches. Now, if there was a problem on the bus that people would need to be evacuated, as people panic, All right, I just want to make sure that you are sharing your screen, Kristen, and it is not just. Uh, okay, I thought I was, but let me go backward. Oh, I apologize. Nope, I wasn't. We caught you before you went too far into your presentation. So Thank you. <laughs> here we go. As I'm, there we go. As I'm learning, as I'm going along. Let's go back to that first slide. This is what I really would like for all of you to keep in mind is the minimum clear floor space is 30 inches by 48 inches which is the exact size of a standard wheelchair. Now, if while I'm in my manual chair, I could scoot sideways magically and not have to parallel park into that 30 by 48 inch space 
life would be so much easier. However, that 30 by 48 inches does not include space to parallel park. So that's a, the size of a standard wheelchair. Some of the larger power chairs take up a lot more space than that. So people are going to be needing to do a lot of maneuvering to get into that 30 by 48 inch space. And my buttons are not working. I am so sorry, you folks. This is the first time that I've done this. There we go. This is what things would look like in the older Gillig buses. When you had two power chairs parked across the aisle from each other, there would be about four inches between them. And some people think that that's enough aisle space and will try to crawl over people, which is an invasion of personal space to begin with and a danger. Secondly, the new Gillig buses, this wheelchair securement areas are staggered. So there will not be a situation like this in the new Gillig buses. Now this is the blueprint of kind of the Gillig, the new Gillig buses. I know it's difficult to see and I apologize. What you are looking at, and it's easier to see from the top, this staggered space is about what it is on the new buses. However, this spot is 60 by 48. This spot is 30 by 48. On the new buses, both, both areas, securement areas are 30 by 48 inches. Again, the size of a standard wheelchair. The bigger, the larger power chairs can be up to 27 inches by 44 inches. So for them, people in chairs like that to park in a 30 by 48 inch space is very, very difficult. This is really hard to see. And I, again, I apologize. In 2016, RTD gave this drawing to a group of people from both the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition and APAC, the ADA Paratransit Advisory Committee. However, and this is where the securement areas are staggered. However, buses with this layout were not purchased until 2019. So RTD knew that there was an issue that needed to be remedied, but it took them quite a while to make that purchase. Now, most of the on the road buses have a layout like this where these securement areas are staggered. Now this is a solution for buses. And I will get to this priority seating space in the next slide. If you had a spot that was 30 by 54 inches, that would make things so much easier for wheelchair users. And when there was no one in that spot, that would be a place for people to stand. Now this priority seating, and I'll go to the next slide to prove this. Think, remember this 30 inches in front of the priority seating, and this would be for someone with a walker or a person over the age, you know, an elderly human. Right now, this is one of the brochures that is on the RTD buses. This is the amount of leg room in front of that priority seating. So people have to put walkers in the aisle. 
the picture on the right shows what a hazard that is when people have to put their walkers in the aisle. Again, think of if there is ever a fire or an accident or a shooting, horrible, horrible ideas. But what would happen in a bus that had very little aisle space? People panic. People don't know how to handle this. Well, the person with that walker would not be able to go anywhere. Again, it is something that RTD does the bare minimum. They come up with that 30 inch by 48 inch securement area, but that is the bare minimum according to the ADA. Just adding four more inches, maybe removing one seat and adding a larger securement area would help people with disabilities so much. And the bottom note here is on the 16th Street free model shuttles, free, excuse me, 16th Street free mall shuttles, the only forward facing seats are in the rear of the bus and up about 12 inches, which makes things impossible for a person who uses walkers to get to those seats. And forward facing seats are required by the ADA. But when things are not done in a way that is helpful for someone who uses a mobility device, that kind of negates that whole idea of the IDA, ADA making things accessible. Now, because I don't use fixed route, I had to I had to use basically hearsay and pictures that other people have taken. Now, if you were talking about paratransit, because RTD got the disability committee disability community involved in the design of the new accessoride shuttles, things are almost perfect on the new shuttles. If RTD would please, please, please get the ADA community involved before purchasing buses, I think these problems could be solved. And that is it for my presentation. And please, please, please ask me any questions that you might have. Thank you, Kristen. Um, thank you for sharing. I, I want to lift up for the operations subcommittee that this was um, a, a follow-up to a conversation on that happened, I should say, within the finance committee to bring um, this conversation over to the operations committee as we started to consider the multiple factors in terms of operator safety, um, operator um, uh, retention, in, in addition to just um, passenger safety, passenger experience, and what can we continue to do to make this a, a better um, riding experience for all, including those that experience disabilities. So I wanna just open it up to folks from the uh, committee, see if folks have any questions, comments, um, for Kristen at this time. Oh, I would be ecstatic if someone would ask me a question. <laughs> and I see Elise. I see Elise. Elise, see you on the floor. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that presentation, Kristen. Really appreciate that. I'm, the two, 2021 sort of proposed bus design, remind me who that was proposed by and where that's landed um, in discussions with RTD? That was proposed by a person with a disability who uses fixed route. I don't know where it has gone. It's something that I was going to bring up with, with Deborah Johnson, just as a throw it out there idea. 
to bring to the engineers and the designers of the new buses or for the next purchase. And I, I think that would probably be great to hear from the general manager, but um, just help me understand in terms of sort of, um, is there widespread buy-in for that particular design? Is that just uh, one idea? I mean, what, what would be the process to have the disability community speak with one voice on this is what we need in order to have, you know, a, a positive user experience that's safe and comfortable? I think the best way to do that, Elise, would be for when RTD is getting ready to make a purchase, to make a bus purchase, to there are plenty of people who use wheelchairs that would love to be involved and just contact us, get us on these proposed buses and let us do a test drive. Have a people, somebody in a chair, somebody with a walker, get on the potential purchase and give feedback. I think that would be the best possible way for RTD to make an educated purchase. Thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you. I want to open it up. Uh, General Manager Johnson, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. And thank you so much, uh, Ms. Trustman, for your presentation. And in the interest of full disclosure, I've had an opportunity to meet with Ms. Trustman a couple of times. And I really want to say that this is low hanging fruit. Um, it's something customarily that I've done at a myriad of different transit agencies in the course of a procurement. But I want to manage everybody's expectations about the steps in which that would happen. Quite naturally, in the midst of a procurement, there are certain things that standard that comes on the bus, but it is within the agency auspices to do the configuration of the seating. So with that being said, we could put forward what it is that should be the configuration of the seats. And I agree that there should be feedback garnered by the community, which is the end user. And I talk about this oftentimes as the design process thinking we want to understand people's pain points, you know, identify and define the issue we're trying to solve and then ideate and go forward. So uh, with that being said, um, what happens is normally when we do a procurement, we get what's called an article bus. We look at it to make sure that it is what we want, and then we go forward with the rest of the procurement. So basically, when that article bus is readily available and is, and is delivered to the agency, that would be the time in which we would have the disabled community, for instance, get on board a bus, ensure that there's ample turning, turning radii when they're trying to get on board, because quite naturally, um, oftentimes people may have uh, bags, backpacks on their chairs and things of the like. Speaking with a unified voice, I know we have work to do, but I'm to totally um, open to this relative to leveraging our uh, constituencies and our committees that have representatives from said community, because then we can identify those individuals going forward. And that's been my experience in the past, which has yielded great results relative to having a configuration that is conducive to our customers' needs. So. Um, recognizing I just had a conversation with our Chief Operations Officer, Michael Ford, who I see is now on the call, and um, recognizing these are some things that happened in the past. Want you all to know that this is straightforward and a simple aspect and a procurement uh, that most transit agencies leverage, so I'm committed in doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much um, for adding that additional comment. It does seem like a very low-hanging fruit and certainly something that um, I think we can all leverage our in, in individual relationships with. Um, any other members of the committee have any questions or comments for Kristen? Okay. Hearing none, I'm going to go ahead and move us forward in the agenda. Thank you again, Kristen. Um, and of course, you are um, always welcome to chime in, obviously, <laughs> um, it, just to bring your additional perspective as we continue on the conversation. Um, but I, I really appreciate you uh, providing that presentation. Um, I am now going to turn it over to Jenny Page. She is the um, audit manager with the Office of the State Auditor. Um, we wanted to provide this uh, subcommittee with an update in terms of the state audit recommendations on operator retention. Um, so Jenny, I will turn it over to you. And then uh, for members of the committee, if you all have specific questions, we'll wait until after the presentation um, and field them at that time. So Jenny. 
Thank you so much. So um, I just want to give an additional quick introduction uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the audits that we conduct or the auditor's office. So I'm a legislative performance audit manager. Performance audits look at agencies or organizations operations. And we do audits of all types of entities. Um, some recent audits I've done were the um, Connect for Health organization, uh, the state fairs operations, um, Medicaid, I do a lot of Medicaid audits. So they really do range. Um, so I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to give you an, uh, just an overview. I'm not going to go in great detail on our findings and recommendations, but I think it will be helpful for you to know of what we looked at and what we recommended to RTD related to its operations to address uh, operator turnover. Um, I'm going to walk through some key pages in our audit report. And if you'd like, I can share my screen um, of that audit report. I think you all have received it, but um, it is a pretty thick report. So um, I don't expect that all of you have had the time to read it in detail. Um, it was just released by the Legislative um, Audit Committee um, a couple weeks ago. So I'm going to share my screen. I would be very impressed if members of this committee had a chance to just really dive into it. It's really good information. I agree. 88 pages, Crystal. Okay. So um, in this report, in case you haven't had a chance to look at it, we do start off, I'm just going to scroll through here. Um, we do start off with a chapter one. Well, let me just mention there is a highlight sheet that gives you very, very high level um, highlights of the issues we identified. Um, and then within chapter one, we do provide some background information on RTD. This is essentially for a lay reader who's not familiar with RTD. Um, I'm going to skip over that. And I'm going to move on to chapter two. Um, so within this audit, we are required by statute to conduct an audit of RTD every five years, and that's a performance audit. And so within this audit, we um, always conduct a risk-based process at the beginning of these statutory audits to determine what are the areas of focus for the performance audits. And early on in the audit, we heard um, pretty much across the board from board members, management, as well as the union and staff and HR staff that operator turnover had been an issue for years. And so that's why it was a key focus of um, this audit looking at operations. Um, we didn't look at some other areas of RTD um, like compensation. We had heard that that might be an issue, but I know RTD was hiring a consultant to look at compensation um, for salaried um, employees and things like that. So I just want to let you know how we um, ended up focusing on turnover. Also part of the audit was looking at the fare box recovery ratio and I do think I'm on the agenda for the February 17th subcommittee me meeting to talk about the recovery ratio. So I just wanted you to know I'm not planning to talk about that ratio today. I'm just going to focus on turnover and how that's related to operations. So within our chapter two, we do start off with about 10 pages of data on operator turnover. I'm not going to walk you through all of this, but some of the key um, things that we did see in RTD's data was that RT, uh, turnover is highest for rail and bus operators, which I think you all know that. Um, but what we also found is that typically it's the newest operators who are leaving. And so that's operators who have less than two years experience are leaving at much higher rates than the rest of operators. And so we have um, data on that. And what we heard from RTD is that operators are leaving not, um, at, they're leaving at because of their choice. Um, they're not leaving because they've been terminated for, for the most part. And so these are operators. Question. Yes. Um, um, what is the what benchmark do you use in terms of what the average percent of turnover is for um, bus operators? 
this is based on RTD's data showing what, so here you can see in this table, this is RTD's human resource data showing how many bus operators it hired each year, how many actually left RTD, and the time frame. Is that what you were asking? No, no I saw that and I see the 26 per, 26%, but what, what is the industry standard for turnover is what I guess my question. What we heard anecdotally is that turnover tends to be high within operators, and I think the general manager could speak to that more. But what we were seeing at RTD is that there are more things that could be done to address that turnover. And so I can't tell you what the, the industry rate is for turnover. What we present here is what it is for RTD. Okay, so here within this beginning of chapter two, there's quite a bit of data on turnover as well as staffing needs of the rail division and the bus division and um, how those staffing goals had not been met. So I'm not going to walk you through all of these details because you can look at the, the data and the charts. But essentially, we just wanted everyone to be aware of the issues that um, had been happening with turnover at RTD for for many years. There are a lot of reasons for turnover. Um, many of them are outside of RTD's control, like the economy or an operator might, might find a better job um, in a different transit agency or an operator may decide that's just not the job for them. They want a career change. So there are a variety of reasons that operators may retire, but there are also reasons that are within RTD's control. So that's what we focused on, um, how RTD can improve. And also in this chapter, chapter, you'll find information on several initiatives that RTD has pursued over the last about two years to address operator turnover. Jenny, so can I ask gonna... one quick question? Sorry, this is Chris Frampton. Yeah, I'm sure. a little slow on the math here. But uh, up in uh, chart 2.1, there's since 2016, just shy of 1,300 people hired and just shy of 700 who left. So does that mean that net net they that RTD has added 600 um, oper bus operators in that time frame? So this is just focused on those newer bus operators who have less than two years experience. So that's what this table is focused on um, to, to show you how many of those new operators left. In terms of... So have we generally kept the same number of drivers over the last five years? Or have we been adding drivers? There is information in here that RTD has added drivers. Okay. Um, to account for okay. increases in services, changes in services. So um, there's information on goals that were set, um, and th those are these charts. So the blue area, the top of the blue area, represents the staffing goals for bus operators, how many operators RTD needed in order to um, provide all of its services. And then the gray area shows... Uh, or the top of the gray area shows um, how many operators RTD actually had. So the difference here, all of the blue blue shaded area is the um, deficit, if you will, um, of, of bot okay. bus operators. And then we have something similar here for rail operators where you can see um, RTD was meeting goals here in 2015, there was an increase in rail service, um, and, and those have been increasing over the past few years. And so as um, plans to increase rail service um, have occurred, then also operator staffing goals, but rail operator staffing goals have increased. And so it hasn't been until um, around May when rail was, um, this chart doesn't doesn't show June, but in June, rail was getting close to meeting its staffing goals. Um, and it, 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 I'll tell you that rail told us that um, at the end of the audit that they believe that they're now meeting staffing goals. Uh, before any of the layoffs, rail felt like it was it was meeting staffing goals. But yeah, those are good Great. questions. Thank you.
Sure. I know I'm going through this quite quickly, so do do stop me um, if you have questions. There's quite a bit of information in this report. Um, and so um, I'm going to skip over RTD's initiatives, and you can read through that. Um, but I, we just wanted to highlight the things that RTD has done to try to address turnover um, over the last several years. What we found during the audit, like I said, we heard from management, the union, we also heard from staff that there still seems to be discontentment among operators and some areas for improvement. So I'm gonna jump into our findings. And um, these, the first three findings in this report really relate to some um, standard HR practices as well as some um, standard practices within the industry for setting up schedules um, for operators. And you have Miss um, Kathy Nesbitt on the line. I think that she is really your HR expert. So um, as as I walk you through these, do be thinking about um, if you have follow-up questions related to HR practices, she's, she's definitely your expert. Um, on that, but the first area where we had findings um, related to supervision. And the way we organize our reports is we state the problems first, and we have these bold um, or caps um, problem statements. And so it allows you, as you're flipping through the report, to just easily see what are the problems identified. And so I'm going to hit some of the highlights here for you. Um, so here we found that um, operators were not always receiving meaningful or adequate supervisory feedback. So the way that um, RTD is structured because it has a union um, agreement, it doesn't do traditional performance evaluations like you might see um, in any other organization. And what we heard from operators and in talking with um, HR staff as well is there, there hasn't been a structured mechanism to provide feedback, either what operators are doing well or how they can improve. There hasn't been that kind of mechanism at RTD, um, even outside of traditional performance evaluations. And what we heard from um, operators and then looking at data is that um, RTD could benefit from, from some type of structured process to provide operators feedback on their performance. And so that was the first area that we identified and we had a recommendation there, which I'll show you in just a moment. Um, we also heard from, from operators and we heard from, from management who agreed with this, that operators don't always feel supported by their supervisors. Um, we heard about issues with lack of trust or lack of communication. It sounds like much of this root uh, is rooted in just um, lack of training for supervisors and um, best practices for communication, communicating with employees. Um, but this is another area where we have a recommendation for supervisors um, and areas to improve training. And then the third area in this finding was um, that operators aren't always receiving consistent um, recognition of their achievements. So RTD has many, many programs that provide recognition to operators and to staff for things like um, if they're accident free or for their years of service or if they get commendations or compliments from from the public or from their peers. There's many different types of recognition programs, um, but we found um, that they're not always consistently applied, that operators don't always know about them, that some operators who um, may have um, or should have gotten recognition told us that they've never gotten recognition. Um, there have also been, um, during the time of our audit, there was a backlog of getting customer compliments to operators, about a three month backlog where customers had submitted compliments, but those weren't getting to operators. And so I'm gonna skip ahead here to the next section in our report after we describe the problems is we des describe the causes or the reasons for those problems. And so, as I mentioned, um, we found that that performance feedback processes could be improved so that there's something system-wide or consistent for operators. 
we found that supervisory training could be improved and um, we found that recognition could be improved to ensure that it's timely and also personal. For example, um, some operators told us they had received award, service awards, for example, um, but their supervisor put it in their mailbox and they didn't see it for a couple of weeks and they didn't get any kind of personal recognition and they felt like it would be much more meaningful if, if their supervisor actually talked to them about it and it was more uh, provided in a personal nature. And then lastly, we found that RTD didn't have a standard exit interview process to determine the reasons for operator turnover. Um, we, During the audit, um, the rail division in particular said that they had recently implemented a process to try to understand why, why rail operators were leaving, but that wasn't something that was consistent across the organization. And so we recommended that. And in our recommendation, you can see the four areas to improve feedback, training, um, recognition, as well as to have some type of process to identify and track the reasons for turnover, such as exit interviews. We didn't want to pre be prescriptive in case RTD has other ideas of how to achieve that recommendation, but to identify and track the reasons for turnover and then use that information to try to to address turnover in the future. I know that with the um, recent layoffs and, and then hiring back that some of these findings, at least during the time of layoffs, didn't seem as applicable, but if RTD doesn't address these problems, then they're gonna continue in the future. And so that's why um, we wanted to go ahead and provide these recommendations, even though there had been recent layoffs. And I'll stop there before I go into the next two findings in case you have questions. Oh, Kristen, I see you have a question. I, I Was paratransit involved in this audit? Or was this just um, bus and rail? It was bus and rail operations. Okay, so Par paratransit wasn't involved in this at all. We we were looking at all of the um, standard bus and rail services. Um, all of we looked at the 100, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But um, the 100 uh, fixed routes. Um, we did look at some that were not fixed routes, but we didn't specifically focus on, for example, ex accessoride um, okay. or paratransit services. We were looking at um, all of the just standard rail and bus operators. Sure. It, it's just um, paratransit has just as high a turnover as it seems bus and rail. So that I just think that would be an interesting addition to the next audit. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Brett? Um, I, I'm uh, a little concerned with uh, the lack of comparative data. I think Kathy's point really was, do we know what's typical for transit systems in general? And if, you, if you're going to look at performance, not just in this area, but in a wide variety of areas, it's, it's really useful to, to have connections into that community and be able to get some of that data. We've used a, a group called Highland Consultants, and they've been really effective for the most part because they're very plugged into a lot of other, uh, a lot of other uh, transit groups around the country. And I think, I think that, that we could, the accountability committee could probably get some better data for you in some of these areas by working with those guys. Uh, I, I, I'd also say that, you know, the other thing to look for are best practices and, and what they do. Uh, fortunately, we have a new uh, CEO and general manager who, who has a lot of experience in, in a lot of different areas, and that's going to be, I think, a big benefit for us. But it's always good to look, look outside uh, for ideas as well. And is it five years before you do your next audit? Is that what I understand? Yes, that's correct. It's a statutorily required audit every five years. And so the next one would start in about three and a half or four years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Kathy? Yeah, I was, <clears throat> I think you're exactly right. Um, it's hard for me to understand whether or not 
26 percent is is significant or not given the industry and position um, and then i understand that what you're seeking came from the drivers themselves i don't know and i haven't read the full report so i apologize whether or not um, the feedback also included um, managers and supervisors so what was their take in terms of of dissatisfaction um, I'm surprised that the benefits didn't show up here or compensation didn't show up here. Most of these are soft skill things that, that seems like low hanging fruit, but I'm surprised that it didn't really um, touch upon any of the more systemic issues that you generally see around turnover. Yes, so we heard from management supervisors as well as the union that these were issues that had been ongoing and they they agreed that these were improvements that needed to be made. Um, we, um, to, to address the question before the, um, regarding um, turnover and comparing um, RTD to other um, agencies or transit agencies, um, what we did find is that overall, um, RTD within the last couple of years had been losing people as quickly as they were hiring them. And so even if that's happening in the transit industry, it was affecting RTD services, ability to provide services. And so that's why it's such an important area to try to address because it takes so much time and effort to hire, to train um, with bus and rail operators to to onboard them and uh, make sure that they're on the right path and then to have them leave within a year or two years um, it, and basically start over is it, um, definitely a detriment to RTD. And so that's why we focused on that area. Um, but related to this, we did hear from management supervisors and the union that, that these had been ongoing issues. And RTD also, we, we have some information in the report, but R, RTD had also conducted an employee survey back in 2019 and found some similar issues um, in terms of discontentment among staff. Um, and some we, we went through all of the written comments that were provided by staff in the survey and we saw some um, it, additional information that supported what we found when we reached out and talked to operators and management staff in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and there were no um, exit surveys provided or they just weren't done consistently? We requested them and, and um, HR said they couldn't provide anything. So there, there wasn't any data or documentation for us to review but like i said rail um the rail division did tell, tell us that um around the time of our audit that they were starting to do those types of um exit interviews supervisors were doing that but they they weren't being provided to management or hr um, and so they weren't in a kind of central location but um and they weren't analyzed in any kind of aggregate way. It was just something new that rail had started to do um, during the course of our audit. So I see um, Director Whitmore and then Chris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, please don't take this comment um, as as defensive <laughs> and certainly agree with Jenny and the rest of the board, uh, I, I'm sure as well. Number one problem pre-COVID, this issue, driver turnover, hiring, about the same that we're losing and, and just treading water. But um, one of the thoughts I had, and unfortunately I didn't bring my report in from my vehicle, is um, we have a very, I would say, small sample size, at least on the anecdotal comments from operators. Um, Ginny, I, you know, I was thinking it was in 50 to the 100 range. And um, obviously when you get those kind of numbers, those that are most disgruntled could be the most likely to talk um, and, and feel, feel you know, strongly motivated to give input, which is needed. But there's uh, probably over a thousand more that did not comment. And some of our newer operators um, were happy with the flexibility of many hours because they needed the, the split shift differential, they needed the hours and so on and so forth. 
So uh, I don't know if Michael Ford or Deborah would um, weigh in on how many total total operators. I can't remember off the top of my head in uh, comparison to the at least the anecdotal input that uh, the state got for the audit. So um, just a, a random thought that's popped into my head during the, the hearing and then again today. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the time. Yeah, that's a good comment. Um, I'll just let you know that the way that we um, conduct our audits is we only base findings on the collective evidence uh, from all sources. And so we um, obtained documentation, HR documentation, data, um, information from HR staff, as well as management supervisors. And then we reviewed complaints that have been submitted to the union. We talked to the union. Um, we reviewed information from the the uh, survey that been, had been conducted by RTD um, and its uh, separate consultant back in 2019. And then after all of that, we said we really need to talk to operators. And so we sent out a request for interviews as well as surveys, um, written surveys, um, online surveys to operators and gave them an opportunity to provide us feedback. And that um, it didn't change what we had been finding. It just provided some of those kind of stories and examples because some of the board members had been ask, asking, can you tell us about a few examples of what what some of these problems are? And so in talking with operators, um, it helped us to dig a little bit deeper and get those examples. But you're absolutely right that in terms of the response that we got from uh, individuals who we requested um, a random sample of interviews and surveys. It wasn't as high as what we have had liked, but we saw across the board that the responses for those um, supported all of the other um, sources of evidence that we had, and that's why we made these recommendations. I do want to give Deborah uh, just an opportunity to respond, and then Chris, we'll, we will get to your question. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Madam Chair. A couple of things, and I just want to comment as it relates to the industry standard pre-COVID, um, the industry standard as it related to attrition for frontline operators ranged anywhere between 15 to 18%. I was trying to Google that number. That's changed somewhat in, in relationship to COVID and so forth, and it depends on the geographic area um, relative to uh, the attrition rate, um, holistically in reference to operating conditions and things of the like. Um, as it relates to our frontline operator staff, yes, uh, considering that prior to our reduction in workforce, we had about you know, 2,600 employees and the vast majority of those being like, you know, frontline operators, I believe about 1,800 or 1,900. So when you think about the sample size, it is true, it's very small. Um, and I just want to say, and I think Jenny, she's worked with, um, our team diligently, some of it preceded me, but in reference to me coming on board in the past three months, I've had an opportunity to engage and want to thank uh, her for her work and her diligence. Um, with that being said, I do think there's ample opportunity as we go forward, recognizing when we a comment was made um, uh, by uh, Mr. Rutt Bridges relative to looking at industry holistically as we look at practices going forward. Uh, we will be uh, leveraging the American Public Transportation Association. I have personally already been in contact with the National Transit Institute, which is a subsidiary of Rutgers University, and spoke to the executive director directly about, you know, train the trainer programs. There's a myriad of different things that need to happen as we go forward. And actually today as well um, had engaged conversations relative to getting operator feedback um, and, and more supervisory training as relates to leveraging emotional intelligence, because that's basically what uh, one could discern uh, that we need to do going forward. So our efforts will be laser focused um, as we uh, march down this path. So that's what I have to offer. And I'll be happy to entertain any questions if you have any for me, but I'll yield the floor back to Ms. Page. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chris, we you had a question about the report. Uh, no, day. I think I'm okay. okay. I just wanted to weigh and say hard job. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I do think I gotta say, I will say a couple of quick things just because we seem to be spending some moment on it, day. I felt like you wanted to focus on another topic, which is really what I'm like. So, but you know, right, I do think it's interesting to compare to, say, Utah's transportation department, but we're not hiring people from Utah and the people aren't going to be going to Utah. So, you know, the, the hiring and, and what it's like in our local market is, I think, it honestly, is really much more important. It, it, it's almost, it almost actually probably doesn't matter 
what's happening in other transit departments of it, it, in other places in the country. It's just different settings. Mm -hmm. um, but here we have to hire against, you know, Amazon or, um, you know, uh, pick your thing. So uh, I think that's one. And then two, I just want to acknowledge this is a very difficult job to manage and, and, and to train up and to have somebody come in. And, and in a very low unemployment environment like we were in pre-COVID, it's a difficult job to hire for. Uh, I mean, driving a bus by yourself, not working in a collaborative environment, uh, six, seven, eight hours at a time, it's, it's you know, tricky. Uh, and it's also one with a lot of responsibility around safety and uh, security of the riders and those around you. And so it's tough. And, and I think that that should be acknowledged. And I think that the, the team at RTD going forward, that's a real, that's a real challenge for you uh, and honestly relates to that experience of our riders and of our employees. So um, it's, it's a really tricky one. And, and, and I can understand why the board was dealing with it pre pre COVID. Thank you. So we have about two minutes left on the report recommendations. Um, so Jenny, I'm just wondering if we um, if you have a couple of high points that we might want to touch on. Yep. Yep. Um, so I just wanted you to know that the next finding that we have relates to rest breaks for operators, and then the third finding um, relates to operator schedules and how to improve scheduling. And so just like Chris was talking about, um, operators really need support in this position so they can be successful. And in the, these three findings, I think you'll see that the recommendations reflect that. How, do, how can RTD provide operators more support, um, improve onboarding, improve training, supervisory communication, but also when they're in their job, how do you ensure that they have the rest breaks they need, the safety breaks that they need, and how do you ensure that they um, can have reasonable schedules and shifts? And so within these rest breaks, uh, within this rest break finding, we did take a sample and look at routes to see to what extent are operators getting breaks within the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, it does say that they should get at least 10% of the time of their driving time of their route should be for a rest break. So for example, if there's a 62 minute driving time, they should get a six minute rest, rest break. And so we were checking to see whether um, operators were getting breaks in line with that agreement. Anecdotally, operators were telling us they don't get their breaks. The union told us they hear complaints about it. Um, management told us they uh, that operators don't always get their breaks. So we were seeing that for some routes, um, within the sample, operators don't appear to be getting breaks. Um, and then in some routes, you can see here, this is organized by kind of most, at uh, least compliant to most compliant. Some operators were getting their breaks. So 3% reflects that 3% um, of the time they were not getting breaks. 100% is 100% of the time for that route. Operators did not get their breaks. And so I'm not gonna run through all of this, but I just wanted to let you know what we recommended here is to improve the processes for scheduling to help ensure the operators get their breaks, their software that's used for scheduling. Um, the type of analysis that we did, RTD staff hadn't been conducting, so we recommended that they start conducting that type of analysis to see if op operators are actually getting their breaks. And then the third area, like I said, is related to scheduling. So similar to what Chris was just talking about, how operators have um, can have long hours, we looked at RTD's data and we saw that happening. We saw, for example, that newer bus operators are most likely to work six and seven day weeks, and you can see the data in the report on that. We saw that their uh, newer operators are most likely to have um, significantly different shifts from day to day. And so we have an example here in the table that talks about, um, or that gives you an example of, for example, someone starting a shift at 12.30 one day, 8.30 the next day, five the next day. And so when there's that type of fluctuation and they're not getting the rest breaks that they need, it can create a lot of stress, um, uh, you know, health anxiety problems. Um, and that's compounded by 
the difficulty of the job already um, for, for newer operators. By newer operators, they mean less than two years of experience with RTD. And so um, we also looked at the extent to which newer operators or all operators um, had different types of routes in different locations. And we were finding that the newest operators tend to have different routes from day to day. They um, are in different locations, different garages, again, that can compound the difficulty of the job. And so with this recommendation, I'm just scrolling through quickly, um, we recommended that um, RTD work with the union because the way that scheduling is set up, it's, it's within the union contract that's most senior operators, the most senior operators get to choose their schedules first. Because of that, the newest operators have uh, the least de desirable schedules. Um, within the union agreement, it also specifies that there should be equity in scheduling. Um, and so we are recommending here, recommended that RTD try to find more of a balance so that um, the most challenging schedules are not always assigned to the newest operators who are still learning the position, um, but RTD would have to work with the union on that to um, try to improve the scheduling process. And then we also recommended that there be training provided to operators and supervisors on how to mitigate fatigue, um, because fatigue can occur um, when operators have these types of schedules. And um, I'll just stop there with those findings. Thank you, Jenny. This this was a lot of information for this committee, um, but we also wanted to just acknowledge that um, given the timeliness of the report, it was certainly worth spending some time, um, given that this is a charge of the subcommittee for us to consider and, and develop and formulate a recommendation. Um, so I, I want to thank you, Jenny, and I know you will be back with us in two weeks, um, specifically talking about the fare box recovery ratio. Um, but I do wanna just, again, acknowledge that we are very close to time and we have one additional item on the agenda that I certainly wanted to get to. Um, Matthew, I believe it is your item. But I could be mistaken. We can't hear you. We can't hear you, Matthew. Nope, I still can't hear you. I think I can try and cover this. Um, so I, it, as we started to, to kind of determine what our next steps are in terms of establishing a recommendation. Um, we wanted to set aside moving forward at least 10 minutes towards the end of the conversation for us to start formulating um, our recommendations. So at the end of each meeting, the committee will be prompted by three questions to help us as based on the information, digest it and start to formulate what might be a rough recommendation that we would then wanna move forward um, to the larger accountability committee. The other thing that I wanted to share just briefly with you all is at the end of the packet, um, I would say starting about page 14, lays out the roadmap for this subcommittee and the topics that we'll be talking about and moving forward. And this is really intended to just keep us accountable and moving forward um, and making progress towards our overall objectives. So the items that you see in green um, or highlighted in green, I should say, are topics that we've already discussed, but now we're in the process of formulating the official recommendation. Um, the items in yellow, we are in the process of receiving information, and then we will need to formulate um, a, a recommendation of some sort. Um, the community-based transit planning, this is one where we will certainly need to intersect with our governance committee, but we just wanted to call that out. So. I am um, open for feedback from the committee if folks think um, we may want to move an item up further in the, the discussion, just given the timeliness of other conversations in um, our peer subcommittees, please let me know. I'm happy to um, please let myself and Matthew know um, so that we can make that adjustment as we move forward. 
Um, I know we are at time. I just want to check in and see if the committee has any questions, thoughts, reflections. We always have a lot in these committee meetings. Yes, Elise, I see your hand. I, I've missed a couple of meetings, so my apologies. Um, the recommendations that you reference say around passes and procurement, where are those housed? Are those completed and ready to go? Or what's the status for sort of keeping a running tally of all of the recommendations the subcommittee is, is coming up with? Those um, at least are in very draft form at this moment. Um, I wanted to wait um, until we receive the update on this fare box recovery ratio from the audit because I, again that's like the biggest piece that has come up within this committee. So um, we'll have something hopefully by the next meeting um, for the committee to take a, a look at. The other thing is um, just as a reminder a similar table was shared a couple of uh, meetings ago, which laid out some early framework for the FAIR uh, recommendation. So we'll pull that back up as well. Great. Matthew, yeah, I think I... it's a balance on whether or not you finish up something before you go to the next one or, you know, finalize them as we're dealing with new issues. I, I do think we just need to manage it so that we, it, you know, things don't pile up when we finalize them all in June kind of okay. thing. Um, but I totally get how a lot of this is interconnected, so it's hard to know when something is complete and ready to go. Thank you for that feedback. Yes, that is, it is a balancing act. <laughs> okay. Well, with that, it is 4.02. I am gonna suggest that we go ahead and close this meeting. Um, and if there's anything else, please feel free to reach out to myself and Dr. Cog's staff. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dave.